Okay, I want to spend some time in this video going over the IRB or Institutional Review Board application and uh, highlighting some of the things that I've noticed are common themes um, that I've seen in the ones I have reviewed thus far. So some of this is stuff that you all know and, or that you'd all be able to guess, stuff that you've all done correctly in the ones I've reviewed, but I want to go through all of it anyway. So the first thing that I want to point out is as you start off, the, obviously this is going to be a student proposal. One of the important things to note is that it is not the student that submits this to IRB. Um, basically you submit it to your faculty advisor who is the person guiding you through the research process so in the case of this thesis I'm your faculty advisor uh, so I have to review it I have to approve it and then I need to make sure that you've passed the human subjects course and if you go to the um, institutional review board for the graduate school of education uh, you'll see some more information about this there the key thing here is that I'm the one who submits this all at the end. Um, you know, and they say that right off the top. Students, only your advisor may forward this form for review. So you don't actually email this to this particular address. Once I've signed off on it and all of the attachments, you'll send, make sure that I've got everything, and then I will send all of that to Professor Redman, who's the chair of our IRB for the Graduate School of Education. So, um, principal investigator, that's you, your email address, and you want to put your tu.edu uh, address there. I'm your faculty advisor, and you want to put my address there. We're educational technology students. You put in the title of your research there. Uh, when you look at these exemption categories, Many of you will be picking number one because you're conducting research in your own class or your own school and you're doing things, and here's the key word here, involving normal educational practices. So essentially if you're just doing things that you would normally have the students doing as a part of what you would be doing in your class anyway, meaning that you're not having them do anything that's above and beyond what it is that you would normally be doing. Um, then it falls under that first category. Um, if you're doing things that are above and beyond what you would normally be asking uh, your students to do, chances are you are either looking at uh, the second or third options that you have there. Um, so that's one of the things to keep in mind. You know, is what you're doing essentially what, if you weren't a graduate student at Toro University, California, would the students be doing the exact same thing in your class? And if the answer is yes, it's number one. If the answer is no, then it's one of these other ones that are here. Um, and two and three are probably likely, um, likely candidates for that. Potentially, research for, or number four is, is also one that you might be doing, particularly if the data that you're using are things that have already been collected. So if for your study, the data, and by this I mean all of the data, so if um, any of the data stuff you're going to collect new, then it's going to be something other than number four. But if you're looking at data that has already been collected, so all of your data sources are ones that have already been collected and you're basically just accessing existing data then you are looking at number four. Um, chances are we're not going to be looking at number five or number six for the nature of our studies. Um, and this is one in all honesty that you know it's just a box you click up here so it's something that you can add after the fact. So what I would do is actually fill out the rest of the form and then come back and take a look at um, what I've got here to see you know which one is the most appropriate for the particular type of data that I plan on using as a part of my study. Um, unless this is a continuation of something that you've already done in the past, chances are you're going to click no here. So this gets us into the meat of the the, the paper, the proposal. So what we're looking at here, an abstract or summary. Now abstracts are basically 
Typically speaking, they are five or six sentences, and they basically just provide an overview of what your study is going to be about. So this is not where you get into any great detail. This is not where you're going to cite literature. This is if you were riding down the elevator over, say, four to six floors, no more than eight floors, with somebody, and they, you know, asked you what you were doing your thesis on. This is what you would say to them in the elevator. So people often refer to it as an elevator pitch. So the abstract is essentially your elevator pitch for what your research topic is going to be. Now, question two is an important one because this is really what frames your overall um, your overall research study. So if you are doing a thesis project, you have aims or goals or objectives for your project. You are looking to accomplish something. And at the end of the day, you will be collecting data that allows you to evaluate whether or not you accomplish that goal or that objective. Now, if you are doing a traditional thesis, you're going to have one or more research questions. And for that matter, with a, re a thesis project, you could have more than a single goal or objective. Um, so, And similarly with the traditional thesis, you're going to have one or more research questions. Now, when you're writing your research questions, keep in mind the guidance that I gave in the video that was related to uh, the Clark 1983 reading. As well, you'll notice in the learning management system that there are a number of resources there, actually both for writing research questions as well as writing um, project goals or project objectives. So make use of those. And this is actually probably the area that you and I will need to go back and forth on the most. So in fact, one of the things you could do is even before you start filling out the rest of this information, this is where you could just email me what you think your research question or questions may be, or email me what your hope, your project goals or objectives may be. And that might save you a lot of information, a lot of um, work up front, because once you know what those are, then trying to figure out what data do you need to be able to evaluate those goals or objectives or to be able to answer those research questions um, becomes a little bit easier to, to figure out. Um, question three, this is where you're going to get into your literature bit. Not in the detailed way that you will for your literature review, but this is really where you're going to provide sort of some of that overview information that you have in chapter one that does contain citations. Um, that's really where that's going to fall there in, in question three. The next question, number four, this is actually how you're going to go about collecting your data. So this is really where you're going to describe that, you know, in the first week I'm going to do this, the second week I'm going to do this, or maybe you do it by months, although most of you will likely be weeks. You know, then I'm going to, um, you know, do, I'm, I'm going to have the students do a pretest, and then I'm going to have the students work using, you know, some sort of type of grouping as an example, what some strategy or tool or whatever the 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 thing is that you're you're studying or that you're developing. And you know, then I'm going to give them a post test. And then following that I'm going to give them a survey that gets their perceptions on things. Or maybe I'm going to interview a couple of them or do a focus group with three of them. Um, you know, for those of you that are taking the project route, you know, this is where you're going to talk about, you know, as you're developing whatever it is that you're creating for your project, you know, you're likely going to be having steps along the way. Think of it in terms of like an instructional design project where, you know, you're going to have, you know, initial analysis steps which will likely involve data unless you've been sort of given a project. Um, and if you've been given a project, you're still going to have sort of a design stage. Um, you know, and then you, once you've designed it, then you, you may or may not get feedback on that, which would be that feedback is data, and you'd want to decide, you know, how you're going to collect that data. Is it going to be through a, a survey? Is it going to be through interviews? Is it going to be getting, you know, three colleagues together or two administrators together and, and asking them questions about it? As you actually develop whatever it is, if it's a tool, if it's a form, if it's a handbook, um, if it's a training, 
you're going as you're developing it you're going to be finding out from potential participants you know if what you're putting together seems like it's going to do the trick then obviously you're going to implement it at some point so you're going to you know provide the handbook for people to use or you're going to you know deliver the professional development that you had planned and once you've implemented it then you need to evaluate it you know and this is where that project goal or project objective comes into play you know because you need to be able to figure out um, you know how you're going you know what data do you need to collect to figure out was the handbook successful in achieving that goal or that objective um, the same thing with your research project you know you want to come through this so in this section in question 4a this is where you want to talk about um, you know exactly what you're going to do on a week by week or month by month basis uh, and be specific so you know this is the people who are going to be your research sample your students your colleagues your administrators folks throughout your district you know this is the specific data I'm gonna collect this is when I'm going to collect it um, you know I am going to be the one to do this um, and you know that would be you in all of these cases because I don't manage, imagine you're going to you know outsource this to some sort of third party um, you know how are you going to um, get your subjects because this is something that you know we are dealing with humans here you do need to plan for how you are going to recruit these people uh, because this is a research study people need to know that there's actually a study going on so one of the things that you would want to do is you'd want to uh, at the beginning of the study because we're working with students is you would want to you know send a, um, a handout home to the parents to indicate you know that this is what you're doing um, you know and and that's something that as you can see in the appendices here is something you would include as part of the form that you fill out, uh, the survey that you might use, or the questionnaires that the questions that you might ask during an interview, or the tests that you plan to implement. Now, if they're regular educational tests, that's fine. You don't need to include those because one assumes they would be content-based ones. But if you're planning on, you know, have there some fancy test for motivation as an example that you want to include. Um, you know that measures the uh, level of a student's motivation that's something that you would include as an appendice um, you know so these are the types of things that you want to uh, include in here and, and make sure you go through and in a sort of systematic way say something about each of these questions although the vast majority of them will be focused upon or the vast majority of your content will be focused upon this one right here is what data slash artifacts do you plan to collect so essentially how are you going to collect your data what what data collection methods are you going to use um, the section B looks at potential risks and benefits um, you know let's face it for the vast majority of our students unless you are doing an action research type study where the results of this study will actually improve your teaching during the time in which you have these current students most of the benefits are largely for you personally and for future students um, or if you're doing a project the benefits are largely for folks that are going to be using this uh, you know handbook or that have received this training or what have you in the future so um, you know keep in mind that you know we don't want to be grand about our benefits because in many cases the vast majority of research studies don't have direct benefits for the individual subjects that are part of the study you know it helps the researcher and it helps future potential human subjects but oftentimes it doesn't um, help the the folks that are in there now having said that most educational research doesn't hold a great potential for risk um, so in many cases there are no foreseen risks involved in much of what you're doing particularly if you're doing something in your own classroom or with your own colleagues because you know the students would be undergoing many of these things anyway regardless if you were doing a research study or not. Um, looking at question C here, 
this is an important one. Um, and gonna, actually, before I go down there, looking back at, at question A again, when you're looking at what data and artifacts you collect, again, in the learning management system, I've put in some information about and links to um, some resources that look at most of the common methods that we use to collect data. But similarly, if you look at the textbook, and this is just a, a Google book preview of the fourth edition of the textbook, and um, while I won't go to the specific section that we're talking about here, if you look at the detailed contents, you'll note that um, chapter 5, and I've got the second edition and the fifth edition, and it's still chapter 5 in both of those, has a full chapter looking at this idea of collecting data. And interestingly, they also have a, a page or so about ethics, which may give you some language that you can use in some of these, uh, to some of these questions. Getting back to the survey, um, or getting back to the questionnaire that you have to fill out for IRB, um, with the data storage, uh, again, Mertler may mention this, uh, but um, things are kind of typical, you know, if it's, um, if you're storing the data electronically, oftentimes where and how it will be stored is, you know, on a password protected laptop, um, for how long, for the duration of the study or for the duration of the school year, who has access to it, you as the researcher, um, you know, the question that you really, that isn't really standardized is this idea of how will it be analyzed. And again, if you go to the textbook, you'll see all of chapter six talks about analyzing data. And it specifically says how. So if you're getting artifacts or text-based data, um, you know, so if you're doing, say, interviews or focus groups where you're going to generate uh, you know, information, chances are you're going to be doing some form of inductive qualitative analysis. And, you know, there's five pages there that talks about what an inductive analysis is. Now, for the purposes of IRB, they really only want a sentence or two that says that you're going to be doing inductive analysis and this is what you think inductive analysis means. Similarly, if you're dealing with quantitative data, you're probably going to be using either descriptive or inferential statistics. You're probably not going to be doing much beyond those two, which is likely why the textbook just focuses upon those two. It doesn't sort of get into the higher level statistics. But again, the same thing. You know, if you're doing a survey, um, how are you going to analyze that data? Are you just going to, you know, look at the descriptive statistics in it, where you're going to look at frequency counts and means, or, you know, are you going to create box plots to present this? Or are you actually going to try to look and compare, you know, questions three, four, and five? I'm going to look at the means of those and see what relationship they have to questions 13, 16, and 18. Um, you know, so I'm going to do some comparative testing or some inferential statistics in those. Um, you know, so look at those roughly 10 pages there where they're talking about quantitative analysis techniques and figure out, okay, what is it that I want to know? And a lot of this is going to be based upon your questions. Like if your questions are looking at student perceptions, you may just simply be looking at uh, descriptive statistics. You may have some inferential statistics in there, like for example, do students who strongly believe in something also, you know, does that f predict or infer what they will say to another question? Um, so you may do some inferential statistics, but for the most part, you'll probably, you know, if your research question is focused upon student perceptions, it'll probably focus, may, your analysis will mainly focus upon descriptive statistics. But either way, you know, one of the key questions here, and the one that you're like above, where you spend most of the time looking at, at least most of the answer, on what data will you collect, in this one, you want to spend most of your time on how will that data be analyzed. It notes here that you want to include any questionnaires, focus group questions, they don't say it, but interview questions. If you're dealing with adults, so if you're doing some kind of study where you're going to be, or if your project, for example, is a professional development session, you want to include consent forms because adults can 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 consent on their own behalf to having their data used for you know the evaluation purposes. 
if you are doing research with students, you want to have parent handouts, which basically explains what you're doing. And these are only one page documents, so you don't need to get into great detail. What you want to include in, in both of these items is essentially, um, you know, what's the study? What does it mean that they have to do? And if they weren't part of the study, would they not have to do these things? And then things like, um, you know, they're not going to get any remuneration for it. It's not going to take any additional time. You want to have a sentence in there about confidentiality. In fact, a lot of the answers to your questions up here are things that you would just copy and paste into either the consent form or the parent handout. So moving on, looking at, uh, you know, number five is fairly straightforward. You just basically tell them in a couple of sentences um, basically where the study is going to take place. You know, it's in your grade six classroom or you're doing it with, uh, you know, these two sections of math that you teach or you're doing it with, you know, the teachers at X high school, that kind of thing. The duration of the study, now this is not just the period of time you're collecting data, but this is the entire study that you're looking at. So, you know, from the time that you get IRB approval to the time you submit your final thesis. Um, you know, so when you're looking at this duration, you know, try to plan in the entire time that you need. And then question seven basically asks you to then justify why you picked whatever of these six that you picked up here is. And that's where you sort of want to take things that you particularly said in question, in response to question 4A, and say, you know, because the students are doing this, this, and this, and this is kind of what they always would do, that's why it falls into exemption category one, or, you know, what have you. So this is where you sort of, and again, don't belabor this particular one. This is, again, going to be one that is fairly direct, fairly straightforward. Um, you want to be as you know concise as you can in this one. So it's going to be like a paragraph, um, you know, probably three to five sentences, maybe four to six sentences, um, but not something that is, you know, a, a long treatise. So, you know, as you're looking at this, really it's in terms of length, question three is probably going to be the most developed section. Um, with question four, when you're looking at A and B, it's the how will you collect data, and then how will you analyze data. That's going to be the part that takes up the most uh, real estate, if you will. And then, you know, the rest of it, as it goes straight through here, um, you know, faculty and advisors, so that would be me. So again, I will submit to Dr. Redman, who is the chair of the GSOE's IRB process, I will submit to her your copy of this document as well as all of your instruments and a PDF of your uh, human subjects training that you've already completed uh, once I've signed off on the document. So that's sort of an overview of this particular document.